Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Judith Rolls, and I'm an Associate Director in the Office of Alumni and Family Engagement. Mm -hmm. I am thrilled to have this opportunity to welcome each of you for this special edition reunion back to school class. Basketball then and now with head, men, head men's basketball coach, Bob McKillop, Jerry Kroll, class of 70, Doug Cook, class of 70, and moderated by Jamie May, class of 70. Before we get started, just a few notes about our format and technology. With over 300 people registering for tonight's event, we've selected Zoom webinar, which allows you to see the speakers, but not everyone else on the call. As a reminder, participants submitted questions via a Google form ahead of tonight's program. Those questions were shared with the moderator and will be part of the conversation with the panelists. Mm -hmm. And now on to our program. While every day is always a great day to be a Wildcat, it is especially true today, as it is my honor to turn this program over to a great Wildcat, Jamie May, a 50th reunion committee member of the great class of 1970. Jamie will introduce the rest of tonight's fantastic panel. Over to you, Jamie. Everybody, I hope you could hear me okay. Uh, broadcasting tonight from uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. The, the hurricane's just gone through, we got no power. So uh, I'm neither bathed nor shaved. In fact, it's probably a good thing because it reminds me of how life was in our freshman dorms at Davidson. I feel like a, I've been in Watts, that single light bulb just hanging down from the ceiling, you know, washing your face in the little sink, uh, temperature controlled by raising and lowering the windows. That's the kind of day I've had here and we still got no power. But uh, a friend, a Duke graduate even, has agreed to uh, help me out and I'm over there. Moderator's prerogative, if I may take it, guys. Um, a word uh, of remembrance to Professor Tony Abbott, who taught many of us, including Mike. Uh, Tony was an unbelievable teacher, unsurpassed, really. Uh, a remarkable citizen of the college and community, a poet and a novelist and least important, but nonetheless very interesting for us tonight, an avid Davidson College basketball fan. We remember Tony with the greatest of appreciation. On behalf of the class of 1970, I want to welcome you to Then and Now. As our reunion committee chaired by Tom Bersuter and George Pinnock put together plans for our return to campus in June, 2020. Davidson basketball understandably emerged as a favorite topic of conversation. And in fact, basketball seemed to interrupt everything we tried to do on other counts. How could we salute some of the great teams of our era Recall the great memories of games in nearly quaint Johnston Gym and in the largest basketball arena in the Southeastern United States, the new Charlotte Coliseum. We also wanted to salute what has occurred at Davidson under the leadership of Bob McKillop. And hence, we are where we are tonight. Obviously, the class of 1970 didn't make it back in June in face of a pandemic. But I'll tell you for sure, and I can tell you on behalf of the class of 1970, our enthusiasm for wild bat, Wildcat basketball has not dimmed in the very least. Thank you for joining us amidst a sad and challenging time for our world, I think our hour tonight will cheer you up. Thanks especially to our headliners, uh, to Coach Bob McKillop, who begins his 32nd year as Davidson's head coach and is currently directing preseason practice in preparation for the opener. Bob, I know you're busy, real busy. And we are grateful that you've taken some time with hundreds 
of Davidson fans who are on the line tonight. Also with us are number 42, a sharpshooter for sure, Jerry Kroll from Houston, Texas, and the intimidating number 24, Doug Cook out of New Jersey. These fellows, along with their teammates, their coaches, gave us all in the 1960s an exhilarating ride to the basketball stratosphere. As Jerry reminds me, we're actually chapter two of the Davidson basketball story. And although this is really not in the realm of our conversation tonight, I just wanted to make sure that you knew that we know that there was plenty of great Davidson basketball before the class of 1970 enrolled. We think particularly of Hobby Cobb, of the Peters brothers, George and Tommy in the late, well, actually during the war. Tommy, after whom the Tommy Peters Award is named, uh, gave up his life in service in World War II. Big John Belk, for whom the arena is named. In fact, we extend all the way back, at least in my memory, the prologue, I guess I've moved from chapter one into the early days, would go all the way back to the 19. 31 team of Dean Rusk, future Secretary of State and future president of Davidson College, Greer Martin. Throw in as well my favorite professor, Frontis Johnson, who wasn't a bad basketball player himself. I really got a little ahead of myself on that. Um, chapter one, as Mary Beatty notes in her history of Davidson, was really the Davidson of uh, Holland and Hetzel and Snyder. And she notes very little in her history of Davidson about basketball, but she did note that in 1964, there were a lot of Sports Illustrated and other journalists scurrying around to figure out where the hell Davidson was located. And as those of us who went to Davidson and have seen the cover of Sports Illustrated and who read it faithfully know that these teams that Lefty put together in the early 1960s, with Terry being his first recruit, were really remarkable. Hetzel, like Steph Curry, was drafted by the San Francisco Warriors. Indeed, he was the number one draft choice uh, in 1965 to the NBA. And a year later, uh, Dick Snyder graduated and began uh, a 12-year career in the NBA. Interestingly, in his last year in 1979, Dick was to win an NBA uh, title with uh, the Seattle team. And of course, Jerry, excuse me, uh, Terry, who we'll talk a little bit more about tonight. Jerry, thanks for that reminder. You bet. Now, quick introductions to our guys who are with us tonight. Jerry Kroll twice earned first team All-Southern Conference. He was known for brilliant shooting, for solid defense, and known for his deep involvement in student life at Davis. Jerry exemplified the scholar-athlete. He was a hall counselor, which is quite an honor at Davis, active in the Sigma Chi fraternity, of which Mike Malloy was a part. He served on the honor court. Believe it or not, with the departure of uh, Dave Moser, he even led the team in assists his senior year with 81. Also believe me that those weren't the last of his assists to our college over the years. Jerry's been a very, very supportive alum, uh, focused on not just the basketball team, but our class. After graduating from Davidson, he took a turn with the uh, ABA Carolina Cougars for a couple of years. He didn't find that particularly satisfying, he told me. And he moved right. back to Houston where he became a highly successful teacher and coach. And after five years entered business with a State Farm. He and Siri have four beautiful daughters, six extraordinary grandchildren and live and work happily today in Houston. Doug Cook, wow, what do you say? 
Davidson, I mean lefty, could count on 15 points and nine rebounds each game he played. Our opponents could count on multiple injuries, not attributed necessarily to outright malice, but to an extraordinarily tough inside game. Schooled, I hear from his friend Cooper Brantley by none other than Tommy Heinsohn, Doug was both nimble and intimidating. He was the 22nd pick in the 1970 NBA draft by the Cincinnati Royals and Bob Cousy. They farmed him out to Italy for a year, seasoning. He, he had uh, serious injuries while in Italy. Uh, Doug will get into that later. I don't know how you really injured yourself over there, but I can only imagine. He came back to Charlotte and went to work for First Union, then returned to New Jersey for a long and successful career in insurance and financial planning. He and Jane have had three daughters, two of whom attended Davidson. Both of those fabulous women married Davidson Wildcats and Bob McKillop, when it comes your time, I wish you'd tell our folks about one of those boys that married into the Cook family. And then finally, Coach Bob McKillop, for me, as I was thinking about it, moderating this panel is a little like moderating a panel on the theory of relativity with Albert Einstein at the other end of the table. Indeed, nobody knows Davidson basketball like Bob McKillop. As I noted, he's entering his 32nd year. He's just a maybe five or six victories away from 600 wins as a Davidson coach. He's had 19 consecutive winning seasons. He's won multiple conference championships, both in the Southern Conference and, the, and in uh, our new conference. He's made seven trips to the big dance, four to the NIT. He probably would cite a couple of other statistics as being more satisfying. 95% of his players have graduated. That's a little higher than the NCAA average. 57 of his players have gone on to play professionally around the world. In 2008, he was voted by his peers, other college basketball coaches as the National Coach of the Year. He has been nominated in this year for the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame. I mean, what have you got to do to get the court name for you? Well, it's done. And we play, as many of you know and have witnessed, with great pride on the Matilla Court at Davidson College. Bob, welcome, and a thank you again. Thank you, James. A, a question right out of the chute for Doug and Jerry. I mean, was this the deal? Have I recreated this with clarity? I've come to offer you a chance to live in the basement of a freshman dorm with a single light bulb handling from the season, from the ceiling. You get to go to classes on Saturday. Wow. Required chapel, three cuts uh, for most classes. Um, also, we have required ROTC for those of you who are interested in the Army. I mean, a lot of us are curious, and I would begin with you, Jerry. Um, why did you come to Davis? What was it about our school that brought you to Mecklenburg County? Um, Tim, I was 16 and a half years old when I started looking at colleges, and there aren't too many, there aren't too many fewer, less sophisticated 16-year-olds than I was 50 years ago. Um, I, my high school coach gave me a good, some really good advice when he said, find a school that you want to graduate from where you get an education that has a basketball program. And so, um, you know, my junior year, my folks and I took a road trip to um, Vanderbilt, Duke, and Davidson. And without question, 
the, even the short visit I had at Davidson, um, there was there was no no decision to be made. That coupled with the fact that Sports Illustrated ranked us number one in the country prior to that, that's where I wanted to play. That's the challenge I wanted. Uh, that was not offered to me at Duke or at Vanderbilt, and it was not available at Stanford, which is on the uh, on the West Coast, which is the other school I was looking at. So I was I was actually uh, advised to apply for early acceptance in an October of '65. I was accepted as a student in the freshman class of 1966. So they did not know about me until I was already accepted in the class. And once that happened, uh, Terry came to see me one time in practice uh, in that October, November area in 65. And my official visit to Davidson was actually in late July of 66, less than three weeks before school started. So, um, you know, uh, recruiting me was not a hard, was not a hard issue. I found Davidson. Well, I didn't, another, that's I didn't a pretty, know. pretty impressive groups of schools coming after. Well, I didn't know about the basement or the bare light bulb <laughs> or anything else. And looking back on it, one of my favorite memories is being able to play in Johnston Gym. As quaint and old and small as it was, that's one of the, my favorite memories of the college. For me, too. And for I bet everybody that's listening to this that uh, is of the right age, there was just something. I'll tell you what else, uh, Jerry, there was nothing like for the rest of us being over being able to go over and play a pickup game where you guys played the real games. I mean, there was just something about it. That court was, uh, uh, to borrow a common phrase, it was the people's court. It was yours and everybody else's, including lots of little kids from in town in Davidson. It, it was indeed very special, very special. What about Lefty? How'd you take to him? Um, I, was, I was introduced to him as someone who could walk on water. And I was discerning enough, even at that young age, no, that wasn't the case. <laughs> and, you know, Lefty and I have become friends in the last seven, eight, ten years. And I, I can't tell you how much it meant to me to be in Hartford for um, his, inaug his uh, induction into the Hall of Fame with Bob, who insisted on coming. He brought Cliff, Chris Clooney with us, Doug was with us. Uh, Fred Hetzel was with us, Dick Snyder was with us. So it was a real, uh, it, it really tied together the whole basketball program at Davidson. It was really quite a moving event. And I'm, if, if Bob should get in, and if so, I need a ticket. Well, I don't think there's any if about Bob getting in. If the question is when. Uh, my goodness. I mean, uh, the credentials are so extraordinary. I, I want to go to that as well. If, if I'm still walking. A couple of years ago, uh, D.G. Martin and I drove over to Duke University to hear Lefty's daughter, who's at Trinity Pre was at Pre Trinity Presbyter Presbyterian Church in Atlanta, preach at the Duke Chapel. And Terry and Ann came, uh, Lefty and Joyce, Lefty in a wheelchair, uh, Obo Joe Robinson, uh, and had a chance to speak uh, with Lefty. I'm not sure he even remembered me. But uh, to see his daughter preaching from the pulpit at Duke University reveals that there was a, another side to Lefty beyond the uh, stomping left-hander. Sure. That's for sure. For sure. For sure. Doug. Yeah. You were a big deal. Pardon me? You were a big deal. Oh. You, tell me about your recruitment. Well, um... You know, I, I wanted, uh, I knew I wanted a good college, good education, uh, and I also wanted to play basketball. It was just as simple as that. Um, and my recruitment process uh, and uh, college search process started uh, really uh, after eighth grade. I, I went to uh, Tommy Heinsohn's basketball camp. He was the Celtic grade of the late 50s and early 60s. And I went to his camp after eighth grade and after ninth grade, summer uh, and after eighth grade, I was there, and Joe Van Sisson, the Yale coach, was there. 
And he came up and talked to me. Um, and uh, I said, gee, my brother has just finished his freshman year at Yale. He said, he did. And, uh, you know, he put two and two together and thought, oh, here's a guy that might be able to get in. Well, history proved him wrong. I didn't get in, but, uh, but I did apply there. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I, I was in a, I was from a high school where athletes pretty much all went to Ivy League schools uh, from Richard High School. Um, so to me, that was the first place you looked. And um, so the coach at Penn, uh, Coach uh, McCloskey recruited me and I applied there. And, and also Brown, uh, well, the coach there, I, I, he came to my house and he was wearing a rumpled brown suit with red socks. So, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure I took him that seriously, but it was a school I thought I might be able to get into. So I applied there. But somewhere along the line, um, naive me uh, came to learn that uh, the Ivy League schools don't give athletic scholarships and that if I were to go there, my father was going to have to pay a lot of money that he didn't have. Um, and I also uh, got to the point where I, I really wanted to, uh, uh, as I got older, I really wanted to play uh, uh, more important basketball games than I would in the Ivy League. Uh, so I started looking, uh, as Jerry did, uh, at, at schools that were, you know, in the top 10, top 20 uh, in the country that, ha that where I could get a good education and where I could might be able to get a scholarship. And uh, in my sophomore year, uh, I'm not sure exactly when, but somewhere in my sophomore year, Lefty was the second coach to recruit me. And, uh, you know, he was trying to sell me on the dream of playing for a national championship. And I'm, I'm sure that was his dream, uh, but it also, you know, it, it rubbed off. And uh, and what added credibility to uh, what he was saying was pretty much the same time. I, I'm not sure if it was 63 or 64, the fall of 63 or the fall of 64, but uh, the um, Sports Illustrated uh, picked Davidson uh, preseason to be the number one team in the country. And I forget which year it was, but it, it, it added credibility that, you know, this guy wasn't just a snake oil salesman, that uh, he, you know, he really did have a team that was uh, that good. Um, so I took him seriously from that point on. Uh, maybe I shouldn't have, but I, but I did. Um, and, uh, and then I was looking around, well, I should probably apply to someplace else where I get a scholarship and, and Duke kind of stood out. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, I, I contacted them and, uh, you know, they were interested. And, um, and then uh, the next step really was visiting. And I visited Duke um, on my visit and uh, uh, very, you know, in my mind, very large, very uh, cold, uh, not very friendly. Uh, two campuses, you got to take a bus from one campus to the other one. And uh, so I didn't, uh, you know, I, I was turned off a little bit by that. Uh, then I visited Davidson and um, gee, everybody was friendly, uh, smiles on their faces. Uh, um, I went down to lunch at one of the fraternity houses um, and uh, you know, saw all these guys in khaki pants and button down collar shirts and V-neck sweaters. And I said to myself, these are my people. And uh, <laughs> That, that kind of sold me. Um, so at that point, I think I had pretty much decided, uh, but I didn't tell Lefty, uh, you know, that I, that I was going to go there definitely until really in April um, after all the acceptances came out. Um, and uh, so I, I, I wasn't, I didn't get into Yale. I did get into Brown and Penn. Um, Duke was an interesting story. Uh, I sent in my application just like I sent it into everywhere else. And I uh, got a call from the assistant coach, and he said, um, where's your application? I said, well, I sent it in. Where'd you send it to? Well, admissions, where would you send it to? And he said, no, send it to me. I, uh, we walked those things through. <laughs> so and I, I never, uh, they offered me a full scholarship, but uh, I never got either accepted or rejected because I'm sure that the coach went down, intercepted my application, took it back to the basketball office, and when he heard I was coming to Davidson, I'm sure he just threw it in the in the circular file. Um, so that that that's my uh, recruitment uh, story. You know, your mention of Duke reminds me of a surprise that uh, Jerry gave me earlier in the week when he described uh, Greasy Bob Verga as a close friend and one of the best guys he knew. 
they'd met uh, uh, a New Jersey guy. Yeah, Bob yeah. Berger. Well, the you know Davidson fans weren't crazy about. It. Uh, <laughs> but Jerry uh, said we had it wrong. I guess they got to know each other during the time of the ABA and became very fast friends. Is that not right, Jerry? <laughs> That, that's correct. I signed with the, with the Carolina Cougars, and he was a star for them at that time. And um, the end of my senior year, I just started working for the Cougars. We did clinics all over the state. And uh, Bob kind of put me under his arm and, and uh, you know, kind of helped me out. Uh, I think, though, you know, we went to scrimmage together. I think he took to me because I would pass him the ball. And he liked that. So I, I enjoyed my short time with Bob Berger. Yeah. Well, he could shoot. There's no question he about could that. Do that. As he you could. could. He never saw a shot he didn't like. Right. <laughs> uh, Bob McKillop, you were also subject of a recruitment uh, at Davidson College. Things weren't particularly good when, uh, in 1989, uh, the cupboard was relatively bare. Of course, you knew about Davison. You were no stranger to Davison. And you might say a word or two about that for us. But why did you take the job and link that, if you will, to why in the heck have you stayed much to our benefit when so many other good opportunities have presented themselves? Clearly, the recruiting process for me was a significantly longer period than it was for Jerry and for Doug. In 1969 of March, uh, I was in the old Charlotte Coliseum and watched as the White Thunderbird was driven out onto the court, <laughs> which Lefty proceeded to drive up to College Park. Uh, that was uh, after the game. We had played East. I was playing for East Carolina. And uh, we lost, I believe, 91-70 in a Southern Conference championship. Um, I, I have vivid memories of the car on the court. I also have vivid memories of guarding Dave Moser and picked him up full court. And um, he did a zigzag drill up the court with the dribble. And when he got to half court, the crowd just exploded. And I thought they were applauding me because I stayed with him. <laughs> Didn't realize that he was just playing with me. Uh, I played the bottom of a 2-3 zone for East Carolina. And every time I tried to grab a rebound, the only thing I grabbed was Doug Cook's armpit hair or Mike Malloy's armpit hair. Uh, those were two of the most ferocious rebounders I ever experienced. But that particular game and that particular year in Greenville, North Carolina, and what Davidson was, opened my eyes to Davidson College. Ten years later, I come back to Davidson as an assistant basketball coach for Eddie Biedenbach, and that in itself was an interesting story. On a Friday night, I interviewed at the University of Pennsylvania and was offered the position. I flew Saturday morning to Charlotte and was interviewed on Saturday morning, and um, Penn was rainy, and I had to go over a few bridges, and the campus was under construction, and David was, Davidson was just in glorious, flowers, beautiful football game. Oh, it, was, it was the most enchanting environment I had ever seen, and I chose Davidson over Penn. Davidson that year was 7-21, and 21, I believe. Penn went to the final four. So okay. uh, I, I've made some decisions that maybe didn't pay off right away, but during that time in 78, 79, uh, I had the fortune of coaching and meeting a lot of Davidson people. And many of them actually have sons that uh, have played for us. Uh, Will Regal and Rusty Regal, the son of Ernie Regal, Connor Perkey, the son of, of um, Richie Perkey, um, Pat Hickert's son we recruited, uh, Todd Haynes' son we recruited, uh, uh, John Gertie's son came to school here. It was an amazing experience for me to see the sense of intimacy that existed. And when I left after that first year, and not many people know the reason I left, um, I, I was devastated because we had lost some recruits and we did get a great recruiting class, Cliff Tribune, uh, Richard Wilson, uh, Casey Ram, 
uh, and John Carroll, they were terrific young men and players. Uh, but I understood what the Davidson fabric was all about. Um, and I wanted to stay desperately. I was offered the head coaching position at Hofstra University, my alma mater at that time, and turned it down to stay at Davidson because we were in a recruiting battle for a guy named Chris Logan from Brooklyn. Well, Chris Logan wound up choosing Holy Cross against Davidson. That itself is another story. Uh, it came down to us, Boston U and uh, um, Holy Cross. And Boston U was coached by Rick Pitino at that time. And Rick Pitino called a very close friend of mine and said, uh, we're getting out of it because Davidson's got him. So I thought for sure we had Chris Logan. He wound up going to Holy Cross. There was an inside guy in Brooklyn that was just too strong for me that I couldn't overcome. And um, I was devastated by that. Turned down Hofstra. And uh, I was making $17,000 a year. And I, I, I believe that I was given a raise to seventeen five dollars to come back. And uh, I asked Eddie to get me eighteen five. dollars and uh, he couldn't do it. So <laughs> I wound up taking a job at Long Island Lutheran as uh, assistant to the headmaster and basketball coach for $35,000. <laughs> That's a pretty good deal. <laughs> no brainer. So I, I, I left Davidson, though, with many fond memories of the people. And in the 80s, uh, I had the great fortune of terrific high school players, uh, Bill Wennington, Marco Baldi, Stevie Rivers, all ACC level players. And Terry Holland recruited a number of them. And I became very close with Terry Holland, another representative of the Davidson man, the Davidson person, what a Davidson guy represented. And it was just such a continuing belief to me that when you go to Davidson, you wear this badge of honor that's pretty special. And then in 1989, I, I did get the fortune of getting the job here. And uh, it, it's been just what I thought it would be. Um, the most unique school in the country. Uh, academic honor and integrity, an honor code, a Christian tradition, and a student body that has a quest for excellence that is extraordinary. And I look at you, Jerry, and you, Doug, and you, Jamie, and your classmates, and all those alums who are on this call, and I say to myself, what great ambassadors you guys are because you have dared to challenge mediocrity and pursue excellence. It wasn't an easy thing to come to Davidson. It wasn't easy at all. But you guys wanted excellence and something different. And that's really the backbone and the, the foundation for what we do here, trying to find those people who are in pursuit of excellence. And uh, you know what's interesting about Davidson alums? They leave a part of themselves here. And I tell you what, that part of themselves that remains here is like a torch that just burns brighter than ever year after year that I'm here. And I'm, I'm forever in debt to you guys for the torch that you have lit that has paved the way for me to stay here as long as I have. Bob, that's our game. Um, were you ever tempted that somebody put an extraordinary opportunity in front of you that almost pulled you away? Well, I, I could have been fired very easily because uh, I was brought to my knees and humiliated in those first three years of, of coaching here. And uh, that same great person that I met in the early 80s, Terry Holland, saved my life. Um, he advised me, he counseled me, he protected me. And without him as the athletic director, I was gone. I would have been fired in a heartbeat. Uh, I, I certainly didn't earn much confidence from the people in our alumni association, uh, from people throughout the basketball world. And if it wasn't for Terry Holland, I would have been gone. And um, I learned in that process that uh, it's not about me. So, so that lesson that Davidson has taught me was one that the Davidson people taught me. And putting people ahead of self. And, and that's become the backbone for what we do here. And uh, I learned that from Terry Holland, but I learned that from Davidson. Uh, I'm not an alum, but I've got a Davidson education and I'm forever grateful for that. Um, the temptations to go elsewhere, uh, I understood that uh, the grass looks greener from a distance, but when you get there, there's a lot of crabgrass. 
I, I knew what kind of grass we had here at Davidson. And uh, Jamie, you might not remember this, but I was in your office one afternoon and I was being courted by a Big East school. And you advised me, you said, uh, you know, I know what it's like when Davidson is at the top of the world in basketball. That happened here. And we were a national story. You go to this Big East school, you'll never be a national story. You stay at Davidson and you continue to work and build, you might become a national story here at Davidson. And that stuck with me. I think that was maybe 1998 or 99. I'm not sure the exact year, but that stuck with me. And um, I'm so fortunate that I've been able to stay this long that uh, the inadequacies that I had, Terry Holland and Davidson College allowed them to uh, peter out and allowed me to stay here. Um, I understood finally that the failures were my faults, not theirs. And uh, once I understood that simple uh, academic situation that I needed to take care of our players rather than take care of myself, uh, things changed dramatically for my life. Wow. I, I've heard a lot of Bob McKillop's stories, but that's that's the best one I, I've, I've heard. Jamie, thank you for talking to me to staying. You know, I so rarely say the right thing. Well, that was good. Uh, it's hard uh, to explain to people who are not a part of it uh, during our time then and, and during the time now, uh, just how extraordinary what Davidson has accomplished in basketball really is. I mean, there were, uh, you know, if, if, if we were in Tony Abbott's class and we needed to make the literary illusion, you know, or in Bible class, we'd do David and go live. Uh, Tony might take us to the English archers at Agincourt. Uh, John Crickendall might take us to the boys in the boat. Uh, but, uh, you know, Jamie, we, um, um, we toyed with the idea, not we, but the, the, the college itself toyed with the idea of, of reverting to Division Three in the early 90s. And that's when Terry Holland uh, came in and on, under his leadership with John Kirkendall, there was a great reflection upon what had happened back in the 60s on the lefty. And to this day, I think that is the greatest story in college basketball history, what lefty accomplished here in the 60s. And we could talk all about UCLA and Duke, uh, but the resources uh, that were given to those schools as compared to what Davidson had, the 1,000 men, uh, the conference that wasn't the ACC or the Pac-8, and Davidson accomplished the most remarkable basketball story in college basketball on the lefty and with the performance of Jerry and uh, Fred and Dick and Doug and Mike and Dave Moser and Wayne Huckle and uh, the list goes on and on. Dick Snyder and uh, it's absolutely extraordinary. Uh, Mike O'Neill, uh, Brian Adrian, you, you you name it. We accomplished something that no school with an honor code, the academic rigor, with the Christian tradition could ever accomplish with a thousand men. And we did it. Bob, I, I have a, a story that, that, that underlines what you're saying. Uh, when, when Lefty went to Maryland, uh, the first person they hired was uh, Larry Brown. And uh, I, I had just gotten married at the time. And then I, I met Larry on the campus. I think I was going to the post office. And he said, where are you going? Well, I said, I'm catching a flight. I'm going up to, back up to New Jersey to see my wife. And he, you know, he said, oh, really? And he digs in his pocket, pulls out a $20 bill and gives it to me. I said, what's this? He says, it's cab fare, cab fare. And I said, cab fare? I, she's going to pick me up at the airport. I don't need this. And, uh, you know, you, that's an example. He came from Carolina, was an assistant coach there. I'm sure the money was flowing there, uh, but it wasn't that. Uh, Davidson didn't play by the same rules that, that Carolina played by. And I, you know, shortly after that, I'm not that that drove him away, but I, my understanding was he left because uh, he couldn't believe that Lefty did what he did with uh, so such limited resources. Look, I think that's true. 
I think you hit it right on the head. He, he took one look around and said, I, I can't do it, um, which is exactly what Bob chose to take on when uh, Larry did not. And when Bob went four and 24 in his first year in 1989, he was even further behind. It was a long crawl to uh, what will be the May Smith Basketball Hall of Fame. Bob, I Jamie, Jamie, the first victory we had was against Wofford. They were Division Two at that time. So Kathy and I drove to North Harbor Cafe to kind of celebrate. And uh, we had a, a, a late night dinner after the game, and we're driving back along Griffith Street, and I get pulled over by a cop. <laughs> 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 and I was going too fast, and um, I may have had a – a glass of wine or something. <laughs> and um, yeah. I, I said to him, I'm just so excited. We had a victory. And he said, oh, congratulations, coach. <laughs> and let me go on. <laughs> so that's a, a memory of our first victory. <laughs> oh, those were, uh, you and Krzyzewski started out the same way. And uh, uh, it, to my way of thinking, it ended up at the same place. I loved you mentioning the father-son thing. Uh, of course, Greer Martin, the president who admitted us, the class of 1970, had a son uh, who came and played. DG played uh, point guard. Um, you mentioned uh, Rich uh, and uh, um, Will Will Regal and Rusty Regal, uh, the, the sons of Ernie's, Ernie's two boys. The the two I overlooked at introducing were you are of equal interest. Uh, your daughter Karen came and graduated from Davidson. And then both of your boys uh, came and played for you, uh, Matt and Brendan. Um, I think those are, uh, that's a testimony to, to you, but it's also a testimony to Davidson and it's a testimony to the ties that bind. Well, that, that's a big thing why I'm still here. Uh, uh, faith, family, and friends. And, and I've had all three of those experiences here. Uh, I asked Kathy to take her three children and move down to Davidson, North Carolina from the comfort of uh, her siblings and her parents and her comfort level on Long Island. And uh, she just willingly did it. And for 31, 32 years now, I get dressed with sneakers and short pants and go off to the gym. And uh, she's been the first lady of Davidson basketball like no one else could be. And I think that's a, a really big part of uh, life is that you're stronger when there's family. And uh, I've had quite a strong family in this process. And as these years have unfolded, I really believe that I've got 105 sons now. Um, it, it's extraordinary, the relationship that exists. And now, after all these years, not only that many sons, but older brothers and older sisters and younger sisters and younger brothers, uh, three of them right here on the screen with me right now, who are uh, wear that same badge of honor that every Davidson alum wears. Uh, Tell me about one of those, uh, A.J. Morgan. <laughs> we were playing pickup with um, afternoon lunch games the year we got the job. And I had the fortune of uh, three terrific high school players become my assistant coaches, John Corso, who has since passed away, Matt Doherty and Don Hogan. And we needed a, a, a fifth guy. And A.J. Morgan was always that fifth guy. He was a rising senior. And he just was so good in those games. I said, why don't you come out for the team? Well, he not only came out for the team, but he became a captain and a starter. And uh, as, as tough as nails and uh, – uh, played for West Charlotte High School, a state champion, and uh, now a very successful uh, insurance man and financial analyst in, in New Jersey, and uh, hit a home run when he got married because he married into Doug's family. <laughs> That's a great story. He, he was an exceptional kid, Doug. I know you're proud of him. You've got oh, yeah. You've got another son-in-law who's a wildcat. Uh, yes, uh, Coley Dominiac. He's now a physician at uh, Dartmouth-Hitchcock Hospital up here. Wow. Well, I, I was to say, you, your story about family extends even further than that. I mean, I've seen a ton of pictures of you at the weddings 
of your players. I think that says an awful lot about that you have earned, garnered from your existing players that they want you to become part of their family, uh, starting of their new family. And you being there is a real tribute to that relationship. So I, I really commend you on that. Well, thanks, Jerry. I, I'm just happy that uh, I was invited to the two McKillop boys weddings because uh, <laughs> maybe I didn't uh, treat them as well as I should have as a, when I was their coach. Well, when I was living next door to you, I heard a little of that. Yeah, every now and then. Fascinating uh, story. You know, Brent, uh, Matt's... Uh, Matthew's uh, roommate was Brendan Winters. And um, their freshman year, both of them were starting guards and they were both terrific shooters. And we're playing VMI and there's four seconds to go in the game. We're down by one point, I believe. And we had an inbounds play underneath our basket and called a timeout. And I kneeled down in front of the team in the huddle and I'm explaining the play. And right before I went to the huddle, I said to myself privately, I said, I, I can't call this play for Matt to shoot the jump shot because if we lose this game on his missed jump shot, he'll feel awful. I'm going to call a play for Brian, uh, Brendan Winters. So I decided to go into the huddle and call a play for Brendan Winters. And as I'm kneeling down in front of the team during a play, I look up and there's Brian Winters sitting about four or five rows up in the stands, the father of Brendan Winters. And immediately I recognize one of the greatest points I've learned as a coach everybody is somebody's son. And uh, I wound up calling a play for Matt. He wound up missing a shot where we were all miserable, but uh, I got a great lesson out of that. And isn't it just fascinating how much we learn from losing as well as from winning? I have a question about that. You mentioned, uh, <clears throat> Bob, the key role that uh, Terry Holland played in your coming and staying uh, at Davidson. Uh, I wonder, if Doug, if you and uh, Jerry might comment on what uh, your relationship was like with Terry. Well, I, uh, I'll, Jerry, uh, um, Terry didn't recruit me. He, uh, he recruited Jerry, but uh, I think his territory wasn't the Northeast. So Warren Mitchell was the guy that recruited me. And then we got a, a, on campus as freshmen he took the head job at William and Mary, so he, he wasn't there for very long. But I uh, got to know Terry. Obviously, he coached the freshman team, and uh, was uh, was the person that kind of held those uh, huddles together. Sometimes, uh, you know, when Lefty he gets a little excited during the heat of the game, and uh, sometimes Terry had to kind of take over in those huddles uh, at timeouts and. Um, so I learned to respect him there. And then I got married in my junior year, after my junior year. And, uh, and Terry ended up was good enough to, uh, uh, you know, get us in on his old apartment, his and Ann's old apartment. And then when he came back as, as head coach, obviously I got to know him a lot better. And, and, uh, Ann and my wife, Jane, uh, have been good friends ever since. You know, uh, in looking at the stats, uh, um, you had a great senior year. You had uh, double double uh, in terms of your whole year stats, scoring and uh, rebounding. Um, you like playing for Terry. Oh yeah. You know uh, when when left again when Lefty left uh, went to go to Maryland. Uh, uh, and I didn't think Terry was going to get the job because he was only 27 years old at the time. But then when they hired uh, Larry Brown, who I found out was only 28, and then when that thing fizzled out, uh, you know, why not Terry? And uh, I'm glad he, that it worked out that way. Uh, he was a great head coach and a great friend ever since. Jerry. Yeah, um, I have uh, recently found out that my recruiting story, uh, I didn't know all the, the – the uh, end pieces of it, um, that while I was accepted at Davidson, uh, they didn't offer me a scholarship till later on in the year. And it turns out that Terry's the one that talked Lefty into offering me a scholarship. So uh, the, the irony of that is that when Lefty was here in Houston, signing me the, the day of signing, uh, whatever you call that now, uh, it was at my house he got the call that Charlie Scott was gone to Carolina. So um, Terry played a big part of that. 
Uh, Charlie was part of the story, um, but I can't thank the old buzzard enough for what he did for me. Um, <laughs> I talked to the old buzzard today. He says hello to everybody. Anne uh, is doing great. Um, she, they're living in Charlottesville and, and having the time of their life right now. Um, Terry and I, um, I can remember being on the freshman bench with foul trouble in a freshman game at Wake or Greensboro or someplace, and Terry sitting next to me, and, and everybody's in foul trouble. And uh, he, Terry turns to me and he says, should we go to a zone? And I just was in shock. Why is this guy asking me what he should do? Okay. And I turned back to him. I said, we have never practiced a zone ever. Why would we do that? <laughs> and we wound up winning the game. I mean, Doug and Mike were just so superior to everybody they played against. You know, um, we just had more talent on the, on the floor than, than most teams. But we wound up owning a house together on Lake Norman, you know. And they say, you, you know, you're real friends if you can – own real estate together and split it amicably and both of you are happy at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, a couple of right there. There. <laughs> we are uh, four minutes from concluding an hour, our hour and we have said precious little about uh, Mike Malloy and even less about Steph Curry. And uh, just to prevent some of the phone calls that are inevitably going to register complaint. I think we're going to skip a few things we thought we might talk about and jump in. And let's do it quickly. We've only got about five minutes. Doug, how good a player was Mike? Uh, well, when he got there, he was uh, a lot of raw talent. Um, but he was one of those guys, and he was very young for his class. So uh, it, was, it was almost like a high school senior age wise. Um, and he got there and um, he just got better and better and better. Much the same way at Steph Curry, uh, you know, got my impression was that he got on campus and kept getting better and better every year. And at, even as a continued to improve in the NBA. Uh, I, I guess that's true, right, Bob? Yeah, he's just got, in fact, one year he got the MVP and was also in the running for most improved player. Yeah. Well, that's kind of the way Mike, Mike just kept getting better and better. He, um, and, of course, he was fun to be around. He really enjoyed life. Uh, he, things got a little dark as when he hit his senior year, but prior to that, uh, he was uh, just a joy to be around. Uh, the 1969 annual has some terrific pictures in it of Mike and Jerry and Doug. I'd urge those of you who are Malloy fans to, Get a hold of the 69 annual. Also, you might go to the Sigma Chi section where Playboy Jerry Kroll is heavily featured. <laughs> uh, he may remember the pictures. You'll enjoy those as well. Thank you, Dan. You're welcome. Let me let me let me say some things about Mike. Uh, you know, when he came on campus, he was a he lived in the room across the hall from me in, in East, and so we got to know each other on the court and off the court. And like Doug said. He, he worked at getting better, and he got better on a regular, on a on a daily basis almost. But uh, the color of his skin did not matter to us at all. You know, a lot of people make a big deal about him being the first this, the first that. Uh, he didn't want to be the first of anything. He just wanted to be Mike Malloy. And um, and Doug alluded to the dark period. Uh, I think he succumbed to some pressure for from outside sources. Um, black power sources, black movement. And, and I'm, I'm glad that where we are today and some of the rough part uh, was, a, re, was a, a necessary evil, if you will. But I think he was being asked by the black community writ large to be somebody he was uncomfortable being. And uh, I'm, I'm so proud of what we did at Sigma Chi and the Fidel's the following year. Uh, um, they pledged... Um, Lester Strong, you were part of that group, Jamie. Um, you know, and he, he broke the color barrier, but he did not intend to break the color barrier. He didn't see himself as different from me, as different from Doug. We were all three teammates, and it, the, the, the color of his skin didn't matter to any of us, not him either. You know, I think in summary, Mike did more for us than we did for him uh, as an institution. A lot to be said about that. 
Bob, I don't know if they're going to cut us off or not at the assigned time, but I can't believe I'm sitting here. And, you know, I find Steph Curry to be the most exciting basketball player I've ever seen. Correct me if I'm wrong. Well, there's uh, a lot of statistics that will back that up. But he's uh, redefined the game by extending the boundaries of the game with his ability to shoot, his ability to pass, and his ability to play without the basketball. And he does it with such great joy. There's no anger in what he does. There's joy. And he makes you feel joyful, not just during his three years here at Davidson, but when you're in his company, uh, when you watch him play, uh, when you speak to him on speak with him on the phone, uh, this is a man filled with joy. And um, as a talent, uh, I, I don't think there'll be a guy that can define the game as well as he has during his time in the NBA. And uh, he he is uh, such a supporter of our program of Davidson College. Uh, we are incredibly fortunate to have his fingerprints all over our program and college. Absolutely. Mm. The uh, 2008 season, uh, Ed Willingham, who I think may be on this call, uh, funneled a couple of tickets in the bank box and I got to see Steph play against Gonzaga and against Georgetown and that was the first time I'd ever seen him play and I, he was still playing in a jersey that was a little large for him. <laughs> and I'm not sure I forecast being the only unanimous MVP in the history of the NBA, but I could tell he was pretty good. And then you guys went on and beat uh, a terrific Wisconsin team and narrowly lost to Kansas. I don't know that there's ever been a, a better season in the history of Davidson basketball, one field with more exhilaration and delight. Thank you for that. An extraordinary. Uh, clearly, Stefan was the guy who stirred our drink. And uh, he had a supporting cast of guys who played roles as magnificently as you could ever imagine. And, and, and what's really fascinating about that team is the character, the makeup of that team in terms of how they each came here, why they each came here, and, and what role that they, they embraced when they came here. And uh, th there's no doubt that, uh, that they embraced Steph his first year on campus because of, of the joy with which he played the game and uh, the, the effusive uh, magnificence of his, of his friendship, of his, of his willingness to just be a regular guy. And uh, no doubt that that was the catalyst for why we did what we did in that wonderful year. Thomas Sander was a little bit like Doug Cook, wasn't he? Um, I, I try to recruit the Doug Cooks, the Jerry Crowles, the Thomas Sanders, the Steph Currys, the uh, uh, DeMond Brookses. I, I try to recruit guys that uh, just uh, carry a chip on their shoulder, but they also carry toughness to back it up. And uh, they're great examples. And that's one thing I remember as a competitor against Davidson, uh, the toughness of that Davidson team. And, and I, you know, look at Mike and I see Damon Brooks, who is our closest comparison to Mike and uh, what he did when he was here in a uniform and, and what he has done since playing professionally uh, overseas. Uh, uh, without doubt, uh, we've had some great ones here. Well, Bob, we're gonna have to do this again. And uh, maybe like the Michael Jordan uh, thing on uh, ESPN. Well, th mentioning Michael Jordan, do you mind if I share two recruiting stories before we leave? Uh, that's up to the authorities that are in control. Judy, is that okay? Well, yeah. th this one, I've had terrific assistants. We, we, our assistant coaches are extraordinary. And uh, in my first couple of years here, we were recruiting Brandon Williams, who became a Hall of Famer for us and uh, an extraordinary player for us, as well as being an NBA champion with the San Antonio Spurs. Well, Brandon lived in Bastrop, Louisiana, and he went to North, he went to uh, Phillips Exeter Academy. So Matt Darty went down there with me to visit the parents to take a visit so that they would have a better feel for us. I think we landed in Monroe or Lafayette, Louisiana, not sure which one. And as we're driving to Bastrop, Matt's driving, windows are open, the car breeze is blowing through. 
it was right around election day. And there's a lot of signs on the lawns in Louisiana, blue signs with just Duke written on it. <laughs> Matt Doherty says to me after about five minutes of driving, he says, I can't believe all the Duke fans down here. <laughs> And of course, it was David Duke, uh, the, the, the racist guy from uh, Louisiana. <clears throat> Second story is uh, we're recruiting a kid out in Colorado Springs. And uh, his name is Canyon Barry, the son of Rick Barry. And Canyon did not play any AAU basketball whatsoever because he was a great tennis player. So I never had a chance to see him other than in video. And uh, his team was not allowed to practice. So Rick worked him out. And I watched his workout, but still not ready to pull the trigger. And and because I didn't see him in live competition. We go to Rick's house after the game and Rick and his wife uh, had a lovely dinner for after the practice. And uh, Rick and his wife had a lovely dinner for us. So then I get into my uh, recruiting pitch. First thing I do is I get on the living room floor and I show Canyon some of the moves I'm going to teach him. Well, Rick gets out of his seat and Rick says, well, this is how I'd stop that move. And this is how I stop this move. And this is how I stop that move. So I, I kind of got blown out of the water there. So I finally, I finally take out the Sports Illustrated from your junior year, Doug and Jerry, which had you guys on the front cover and Mike on the front cover. And I said, you know, Davidson's on the front cover of Sports Illustrated. And this is our dream. This is our image. This is our vision. And I'm feeling pretty good about that. So Rick says, hey, hey, let's go down to my basement. So we go down to Rick's basement and there are four Sports Illustrated covers with him on the front cover <laughs> on the walls. So it needs us to say again, Rick, boom, he, he just blew me out of the water. <laughs> Canyon wound up going to uh, play for Bobby Cremens at Charleston where Bobby had coached both the uh, Skipper, I think, and uh, I forget the other uh, one of the, uh, Rick's sons, but he coached Sco Scooter and uh, Scooter and I think... Uh, John Barry. So, in our next installment, we're gonna we're gonna go back to Bobby Cribbins and John Roach to the Charlotte Coliseum and my favorite basketball brawl. We've got several stories. We had several inquiries about that. That'll be fun. Again, Bob, uh, we the class of 1970 salutes everything you've accomplished on behalf of Davidson College. It's just unbelievable, and we are very grateful and we're very admiring. Doug and Jerry, thank you for the memories, man. Uh, those were great years. Uh, Glad to be part of it. And, and yeah, Doug. Maybe we'll have you represent. Thank you, guys. Well, I know it's starting to snow up here. <laughs> Maybe that's the signal for me to shut up. <laughs> I'll do it. Good night, everyone. Yes, thank you so much, right. everyone. Thank you, Jamie and Coach and Doug and Jerry for taking the time. I am sure many folks are sad that we're cutting off this amazing conversation. I think there's something to your installment number two there, Jerry. I <laughs> um, want to also thank uh, the Class of 1970 Reunion Committee for sponsoring this event. Really grateful for, for uh, all those folks putting this together. This presentation has been recorded and will be placed on our YouTube channel in a few days once it's been captioned. And so please do feel free to share with others who were not able to join us this evening. If you want to check out some other programs, um, just hang on and watch some of the slides after this. We've got more programs still coming up that are sponsored by the uh, Office of Alumni and Family Engagement. Thanks everyone for joining us tonight. See Good you night, soon. Bob. Good night, Doug. Good, Good, night, Good, night, Good, Good night, Jamie. Good night, Judith. Good night, Judith. Oh, no, you go over here to leave.